Good morning everyone, Trackman44 here. You know, springtime's upon us, the weather's getting really, really nice. We're having mid to upper 70 degree temperature. And I've let the winter slip by us and I did not get my second heating and air conditioning ductwork system installed in my son's attic, which I really want to do for warm weather. So, you know, i just too busy with too many other projects. So now that the weather's getting too hot, I'm going to be spending some considerable amount of time in the next couple of weeks in and around his attic. It's going to be a pretty good little project. I won't take you along for the whole ride. But I will show you a couple things we're going to make, you know, as far as the sheet metal is concerned. The first piece is going to be really kind of odd. And uh, it's something that's that's a little above and beyond. But because it is my son's house, and I want him to have a what I would consider a, uh, a premium system, ductwork-wise and in installation-wise, I guess, um, I'm going to go that extra extra step. And I'll try to explain it to you and, and the reasons behind. Uh, now, you know, I could do it a whole lot easier way. Just slam something together, you know, wrap some duct tape on it, and then go with it. But that's not what I'm going to do. I've never done that kind of work in the past, and I'm not going to do it in my retirement. Even though I do not do this commercially at all anymore, I do do it <laughs> on occasion. I've been known to kind of help a few people out every now and then. But at any rate, I'm going to show you all this first piece of duct and try to explain to you why it's as wanky as it is. Now, first and foremost, uh, one thing i got to explain. This is a two-story house. And you seldom have a single system in a two-story house that uh, that operates adequately. It takes a lot of control work, a lot of extra things in the ductwork, and a, a lot of uh, sophistication, so to speak, as compared to a standard system to make a single system uh, function adequately, which is why we're eliminating that first system or the original system and putting a separate system downstairs uh, coupled with a wood furnace as well as a complete separate sex, uh, system up in the attic. So at any rate, if you've got a system up in the attic, you have to, got to get a way to get the return air back to it. So I'm going to put a single opening hallway area and draw that air uh, from that common area simply because, uh, number one, it's central to the whole upstairs area, and number two, it's, it's not going to generate excessive noise in the bedroom. Uh, so at any rate, this is this right here is going to be the return air opening, 16 by 20. That's going to, to line up with the hole in the ceiling or in the in the uh, drywall in the ceiling. And the return air filter grill will insert up inside this and screw in place to where the filter can be serviced and changed from inside the space on uh, just a small stool or step ladder. But at any rate, uh, this is a very small system. It's a two-ton system, and we have to adequately get the amount of air into the return air of that. Uh, uh, of that that furnace or air handler so to speak so the the confines of the attic the the construction the way the trusses are uh, the bracing and things like that you've got to dodge and go around some things but we have to make sure that we don't pinch down and and restrict airflow to a great extent now the return air opening in the bottom of the air handler is just 10 inch by about 20 inch so as long as we maintain that minimum dimension throughout our duct we're going to be in in, in great shape well, the 16 by 20 far exceeds that, so I have to shift it backwards because of wall con constraints downstairs, and I'll pinch it back to where we've got 11 to 12 inches. If it just, just rule of thumb with, um, with standard residential systems, you have 70 square inches per ton of return air. You've got adequate return air space. Uh, 70 square inches is... Uh, per ton on a two-ton system results to 200 and, uh, two, uh, 140 um, square inches, and I've got roughly 210. So we're we're definitely uh, above and beyond what's required to maintain that low velocity associated with the less the lesser noise level within a trunk line. Now y'all remember the cheek bender? This would be a classic example of where it works uh, where it works just wonderfully but probably does not get every one of them. Concentrate on your larger quarter inch bins. There we go. We have to finish this with a block of steel, farm this one by hand, and finish uh, this one with a block of steel. When it comes to farming metal, just about anything can be used as an anvil. Uh, square pieces like this, or even rounded ones in some cases. I'm sure everyone remembers that uh, noisy machine called the lock farmer. <laughs> it's a, a necessary evil. Ready to assemble, doesn't look like it. Now I know it looks kind of floppy and difficult to assemble, and uh, some of them really get uh, to be a bit challenging. But after you do, you know, a few hundred of these or, or whatever, you kind of get uh, kind of get a knack for holding them in position to get them started. Of course, as far as noise level is concerned, the lock farmer can't hold a candle to uh, 
to the electric hammer. Uh, boy, it really makes it makes a nice, tight, smooth joint though. Uh, this platform right here is going to uh, allow the auxiliary drain pan to rest right on top of it. The furnace is going to sit right in that, that area. I'll be cutting a hole in the back of this, putting that dovetail fitting in to tie into the rear of the air handler, and the hole in the floor will align with this 16 and a quarter by 20 and a quarter opening, flanged opening, one inch double hem flanged, so that we can, when we screw the grill on, get a real secure uh, amount, you know what I mean? And then of course I have to fabricate a uh, an end cap, just like a duct working end cap, to uh, S and drive connect on the end, which then of course everything is going to be painted with duct sealant, and it'll be allowed to cure for 24, 48 hours or so before we ever, ever disturb it. Uh, but like I say, this is just the first of many fittings going into this second story system. When I started this video uh, a little while ago, I forgot to, uh, in the lead-in, tell you that this was part one of the second story, or the attic system, sheet metal project going into my son's house. It's going to be an R410, refrigerant 410A uh, heat pump system with a 10KW air handler. Uh, and, and, and of course all the controls and everything necessary to cause it to function correctly. But it's going to be uh, an, an attic, in, attic install R410 split system, 10KW electric air handler, and then outdoor unit. Part one of hopefully not too many. Now the secondary drain pan has got to be large enough to encompass the entire air handler and kind of expand uh, just around a little bit in case it drips out the corners. You can't really tell, you know, but I left a tab here and I've also got this laid out to be a 180 degree fold over and then also another 180 degree fold over. That'll make it sturdier, you know, around the perimeter. Uh, and as you can see, it's going to be a pretty large pretty large and somewhat floppy drain pan if we don't make it as, as heavy as possible or as as tightly uh, jointed as possible. Now what I'm going to do as I fold this all together this tab is going to be sticking up at 90 degrees and it should insert underneath this tab up here which I'll latch down with a hammer. In the old days we would go ahead and solder that joint all four of those corners up but now with the modern day RTVs and the uh, the sealants like the Vulcan the Vulcan sealants and things like that, we don't have to worry about soldering anymore. That stuff is going to outlast us. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. This needs to be folded in a box and pan break, and it's 51 inches long, and my box and pan break is only 48 inches. Now, for those that may not be familiar with the term box and pan break, um, if you notice, this has a bunch of removable yellow, yellow fingers. They, a lot of times they call it a finger break uh, because those fingers can be actually removed. Uh, and it, it takes you from having a solid bending surface to a partial bending surface. But the cool thing about it is if you notice right here, you have distance between that portion of the brake and the uh, the actual apron or the, the, the part that does the bending. And so that allows you to fold boxes or the edges of boxes by turning them 90 degrees, sticking them in there, and folding up without doing damage to it. So that's why we call this a box and pan break. You build boxes and pans out of it. And what I'm doing now is a drain pan, so that's why it's coming into play. This one has very limited um, capacity. It's a four foot, a four foot 22 gauge break. Uh, you can fold sharp pieces heavier than 22 gauge. Sharp pieces, six, eight, 10 inches, you can fold a little bit heavier, but uh, it's, it's not recommended. I've adjusted, I've removed that one uh, finger right there in the middle. And then I've adjusted these, got a little spacing in them, to where I've got the inside dimension of my pan. My pan is 22 and 5 eighths outside, so I set that width at roughly 22 and a half inches, and that's going to allow me to lay that tray in there, and then fold up the end pieces to, to facilitate assembling the corners. Now I folded the, because the length is 51 inches, I can't fit it in the 48 inch break, I went ahead and folded the lengthways pieces in the big 8 foot break, and broke these guys just a little bit. To, uh, to make it easier for me to, to fold on the, on the box and pan. And if you notice, remember I said it was going to have some weird tabs. I don't know that you can actually see these. Here's a little tab that I told you was going to be sticking 90 degrees out. And hopefully when we fold this up 90 degrees on the box and pan break, this tab right here will slip underneath this tab right here and lock down in place, making a very secure and very uh, stable corner. And then we will caulk up the corners with that uh, Vulcan. Okay, there's the drain pan fully farmed. I do not have all the corners locked completely in place yet. So let's just sit right here and take a look right here in the corner. You need to take your uh, handy dandy leather man and on this tab that you fold it over you can stick a thin blade in there and just kind of pry it just a little bit 
and you can just pull this right into there just like that right there you just tap this in there's a little springiness to it until you get everything set in place kind of set the corner over okay but then you got these fancy little tools here don't really know what they are but they um, they're for putting end caps on but you can slide that right into there like that and make that latch right there that's going to hold it in place perfectly until you uh, caulk this entire corner and right up the sides with that uh, Vulcan polyurethane sealant we do the same thing over here As a matter of fact I slipped that one in already so it's up in there all I got to do is tap it over out here on the back side tap this down a little <clears throat> gutter guys use this particular tool on occasion but just hold it right there on that and it just crimps all of them it penetrates all of them just kind of just kind of forces the the thickness of metal together and it, it'll be all covered up with caulk but it doesn't matter even if we don't caulk that high the float switch will energize the safety circuit well before that depth anyway the water ever gets to that depth so hopefully it kind of shows you a little bit of the concept behind how a box and pan brake works and the, the semblance of what you can farm with a box and pan brake in your shop. Now what I've done, I just put one cross brake. I thought I'd better point that out. I just put one cross brake right across the center. That's because I'm going to put that and hang that, high, that side maybe a quarter of an inch higher. And I want the water to drain all the way to this corner. And up here by the control compartment on the uh, electric air handler, I'm going to put the float switch up here. So it won't take near as much water to trip the float switch. Now, I ain't never used a selfie stick before, but there's a first time for everything. We got a little bit of a start going on, and I can't do any more until I get more measurements. Can't get any more measurements until I get the air handler hung up in the, uh, up in the attic space. Uh, get some lights and stuff up there, you know, and, and get some stuff to walk on. And then once I get that done, I can install this uh, return air filter grill, this return air uh, box, install the air handler. Then I can get the measurements for the supplier system, and then go about the business of uh, fabricating all that and then we'll get to install it. Now this is a very small system, it's only a two ton system, so the ductwork's not gonna be very large, uh, but it doesn't mean it's gonna be simple. The, if you guys have ever worked in attics, crawling around on your hands and knees, balancing on the uh, two by fours and stuff up there, you know, on the, on the trusses, uh, it, it gets a little precarious. You know, you're churning up the fiberglass and, the, and possibly the blown cellulose. Uh, he has fiberglass, I prefer cellulose myself. It doesn't affect my throat nearly as bad, nor my eyes either one. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. You do what you got to do. But uh, we, we just want to get that done pretty quickly before it gets too hot. So, um, like I said, uh, hopefully you enjoyed a little bit of that today. I know it's, it's, it's boring. You know, it's just stuff that, you know, we do. You know, it's, it's not a big deal or anything like that. Uh, and it's enjoyable. It's fun. I enjoy it. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. Well, I ain't enjoying this attic too awful much. But I'm going to do it anyway because, like I said, it's my son's house. But at any rate, we've uh, pretty much beat this one to death. I tell you what, I think um, this is Trackman 44, and I am out of here.